This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. and Thank you to Alejandra for inviting me and also for the uh, Institute of, of Re uh, Historical Research for hosting the event and everybody for coming today. So. Uh, my presentation today is very much a work in progress and loosely based on a new book project tentatively titled The First Modern, Imperial Baroque Modernity in the Spanish Habsburg World, which examines the articulations of the image of the king in urban rituals throughout the Habsburg Empire and their workings in the creation of a shared political culture that made possible imagining and ruling its vast and diverse possessions in the late 16th and 17th centuries. In the first Spanish dictionary published in 1611, Sebastián Covarrubias defined modern as that which is newly made, or lo que nuevamente es hecho, and which he stressed lacked the authority of uh, antiquity, or antiguo. My current research charts the development of this modern in the Spanish Habsburg world by focusing on the political culture deployed after 1519 that made possible the ruling of this vast empire of the 16th and 17th centuries in America, Asia, and Europe. More specifically, I examine the technologies of monarchical representation and political rule developed to make the distant king present and legitimate throughout its vast and varied global empire. Through the analysis of urban rituals and ceremonies centered on the king's body and his life cycle, the theories and theologies of empire, the roles of cities both as material places and imagined spaces, and the circulation of various forms of print, my study traces the dissemination and solidifying of monarchical rule within a larger process of imperial legitimation. In other words, my study elucidates the various practices by which performances of these ceremonies helped create a common sense of belonging to this world empire. Part of my analysis is concerned with how the sense of belonging was the product of the creation of a new time, a ceremonial time that synchronized these performances of kingly ceremonies, i.e. birth, marriages, proclamations, and royal funerals across the empire. This ceremonial time produced a common sense of space, an imperial space defined in part by architecture, the layout and use of certain streets in these performances, the existence of the plaza, various common uh, sounds, all which produced a new timing or structure in daily life. Various forms of writing aided in the production of this new time beyond these performances. Um, Chronicles, uh, um, for example, um, I lost my place here, <laughs> looking out the, the door. <laughs> uh, regulated, uh, for example, uh, royal decrees that regulated urban designs, but also the structure, time, shape, and place of these ceremonial performances, chronicles reporting their outcomes, sermons, uh, but also maps, and so on. This new project stems from concerns and questions uh, raised by prior research on the making of Lima as capital of the Vice Royalty of Peru, circa 1540-1700. to 1700. As it is known, unlike Mexico City, which was founded and built as a Spanish city on top of and around the conquered as the capital of Tenochtitlan, Lima was built from scratch on the desert along the coast in South America. My book, Inventing Lima, traced the transformation of a hamlet of ramshackle structures into the legitimate center of the viceregal court and thus of Spanish imperial power through a series of both civic and religious ceremonies and the published writings of those events. It was while researching that book that I became aware of arguments about the modern and modernity as this concept was understood at the time or as the newly made, a newly made that by virtue of its newness then also lacked the authority of antiquity. The notion of a modern opposed to oldness, as Antigua could also be translated, were echoed in a variety of other writings, such as histories of the conquest, natural histories, chronicles of religious orders, histories of buildings, prosopographies, and so on. 
It was in discussions while at the John Carter Brown Library as a fellow, particularly with scholars working on British America and on the global circulation of silver, that I also became keenly uh, keenly troubled or uncomfortable with the language and concepts used to tell the story of 17th century America, particularly with the use of colonial to refer to this period, which also always meant pre-modern or simply not modern, and with the anachronistic sign Latin America. I wrote much of Inventing Lima while living in the great metropolis of Mexico City, which made me think even deeper about the issue of language and of the importance of the conceptual framework used in the writing of what is still referred to as colonial Latin America. In part because there, rather than colonial, the 17th century was referred to as the Antiguo Regimen, which, for obvious reasons, I found equally problematic. It was also in Mexico that I became acutely aware of the political marginality of Peru and of Lima in that colonial Latin American historiography, where when set against that of the great Mexican nation, marginality due in part to 20th century uh, geopolitics, but also because most history of this period continues to be national and or also is uh, steeped in a national center periphery progressive framework. Furthermore, the shift uh, from colonial to an Atlantic framework, for reasons I will discuss later, have changed little in how the history of the 17th and, uh, 16th and 17th century Spanish world is framed and thus understood, or in revising this 20th century geopolitic, uh, geopolitical emphasis. In the end, I concluded in that book that Lima and the Viceroyalty of which it was part, far from colonial and peripheral, was rather a modern Baroque metropolitan center in its own right, embodied, for example, in the 17th century notion of Empire of Peru, which took over a century to disarticulate first by the Bourbon reforms and could argue, it could be argued that was finally ended by the War of the Pacific in the 1880s. Along these lines, my new study, rather than following a linear progressive understanding of empire, which uh, with a well-defined center or metropolis and peripheries that function for its benefit, is concerned with how the Spanish king was made present and legitimate in different places and spaces of the vast body that was the Spanish Habsburg Empire, how his image worked in the construction of an imperial geography of urban power and in the creation of a common political culture center on his body how the city, now closely associated with the presence and majesty of the king, and as such with cultural production and various forms of power, became the central stage of this new form of rulership. How all this was the product of a cultural grammar that borrowed and was transformed by local circumstances and context of multiple origins, and how this process was the result of a new uh, modern ways of representation, writing, and performances central now for exercising political power from afar. Few works today um, have t undertaken the study of this royal presence and the imperial political culture that unify the empire across oceans and continents, and its role in the creation of allegiances or love and obedience in the parlance of the time to a distant Spanish monarch. Those studies that undertake such analyses tend to be limited by a framework closely contained within the border spaces of nation states. Monarchical rule is therefore analyzed in discrete geographical and political as well as cultural spaces, Spain, Portugal, Naples, Mexico, Peru, Italy, and so on. Often losing sight of the larger field of interactions that was the empire proper. Sanjay Subramayam has recently identified a similar problematic for the study of the uh, Portuguese empire. One result of such an approach has been to reproduce a center periphery model of cultural production where Spain, or Iberia, in this case Madrid, is seen as the generator of a political culture that was later adopted and at most imitated in the overseas possessions. <clears throat> 
The recent exception to the center-periphery model of cultural production is Serge uh, Gruzinski's study of the 17th century Baroque as a kind of cultural mestizaje that traveled the world around borrowing elements from the different places and spaces of interaction being transformed in the process into a hybrid style that defied a clear origin. Along these lines, I suggest here that not only did the repetition of architectural forms and urban designs create a common cultural structure and space for the exercise of imperial power in this vast composite empire, but also that the forms of ritual celebration center on the Spanish king's body foster common practices and understandings of his political figure and legitimacy as ruler in the wider Spanish world. In other words, I show how these synchronized repetitions contributed to the creation of an imperial political cultural grammar that allowed vastly distant and presumably radically different places and peoples to imagine themselves as equal members of a universal Spanish empire, eventually ruled from Madrid. And how these practices, by defying a clear metropolitan origin, were therefore modern. And here, this is you know some of the. This is very clear in kind of these structures of cities, for example. Um, now, through the analysis of what it meant um, to be modern in this imperial context, uh, my study challenges a historiography that both characterizes colonial Latin America and the larger Spanish empire as an index of everything that is not modern and ties the historical rise and expansion of the modern to that of the Protestant West. Rather than seeing the modernity of the Spanish Habsburg world as a peripheral colonial modernity, my study rethinks it as a particular Baroque instance of the metropolitan modern. Modernity, I argue, like the Baroque to which it was closely connected, had multiple origins and took on different forms as it developed in response to political, economic, and social conditions and challenges emerging coevally in different regions of the empire. As such, this imperial modern was metropolitan. From its inception, its ideas, forms, structures, as well as as its influences did not simply flow from one center to a distant periphery, but rather traveled back and forth and across multiple sites and spaces, becoming transformed and regenerated in this process in non-linear progressive ways. My analysis of this modern of the newly made without the authority of antiquity shows that in the 16th and 17th centuries there was an attempt to construct an epistemology that would lend authority to this modern of the newly made by connecting it to novel understandings and material forms of antiquity. A key element in this process was uh, provided by ruins understood both as a falling down or old remains uh, of existing structures and as rising up material artifacts as ruins were now built, for example, to look as such and thus physically mark on the ground and on maps the precise sites of ancient battles mentioned in books and also um, uh, buildings that were no longer existent, as well as a new topos of historical writing. The ruin as top, topos uh, had important implications for the writing of histories as genealogies, the creation and organization of archives, mapping of the empire, and the formation of local and imperial identities by grounding the empire's authority in a deep past of recent creation. Ruins also work to endow newly made cities with necessary cultural antiquity to claim status within the urban geography of power that ordered and came to characterize the Spanish Empire. Since the 15th century, new territories could be incorporated into the Spanish monarchy either by aggregation or integration. Those territories incorporated by aggregation retain their existing laws and privileges, while those incorporated as accessory became possessions to an existing crown. The New World territories belonged to the crown of Castile after they became accessory to that crown. In practice, however, 
As aggregation became recognized as a superior form of political organization, the preservation of the law and custom of each place became the political practice of even those territories incorporated by conquest, such as the Americas. By the 17th century, and out of a desire to equal other kingdoms in terms of privileges and rights, Peruvian and New Spain elites, for example, insisted that by the conceding of sovereignty to the Spanish by the Aztecs and the Incas, these two territories had voluntarily aggregated themselves to the crown of Castile. These claims were made in hopes of increased autonomy from the crown in order to cement their own local power, as well as consolidate the place these kingdoms occupied within the larger empire. Equally important, however, is that this claim also implied the creation of antigüedad, or the existence of the necessary genealogies, a deep past, upon which to build precedence and antiquity, or a form of traslatio imperi. While it has been noted by John Eliot and Anthony Paglen, among others, that the discovery of the New World and the extension of the Holy Roman Empire to include these overseas possessions posed new and unprecedented challenges to existing forms of political rule in the Old World, the historiography has been slow in noting that many of the solutions to these new political challenges were introduced and often worked out in the New World context before or at the same time they were introduced and became established practiced in Europe. This lag in understandings is due in part to the framework used to write the history of this period. From a center periphery linear perspective, the scholarship takes Europe to be the center of all cultural and political production, as I mentioned already, assuming further that European cultural forms, political institutions, and social and economic structures were produced and exported abroad where they were received, and at best negotiated during their implementation according to local circumstances. While from a national framework treats the various geographical locations of this large empire as if they too neatly again coincided with discreetly bounded national spaces, Mexico, Peru, Philippines, Italy, Spain, as already suggested often further obscuring larger and more complex processes of exchange and cultural formation that transcended oceans and continents. Furthermore, the concept of an old world juxtaposed to a newly discovered one has further masked the newness and thus modern of this concept, or as this concept was then understood, by associating the new with peripheral and underdeveloped of the political culture that came to rule over the Spanish Habsburg Empire as a whole after 1519. My study, in contrast, takes 1519, therefore, as a moment of rupture, not only in the history broadly defined of the Indies, but also in that of Europe. In Europe, in 1519, Charles I of Castile became Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor. In America, in 1519, Hernán Cortés launched his conquest of Mexico. I argue that as such, these two events would serve as points of departure for all sorts of new relationships, practices, and understandings, not just between America and the Iberian Peninsula, but also for all the European possessions now under Charles V dominions as both Holy Roman Emperor and as King of Spain. I am suggesting here, therefore, that the political culture developed in America after 1519 and post-1570s in the Philippines did not derive from knowledges or practices already in place and well established in Spain or its European possessions and merely copied and negotiated by its so-called colonies, but rather that the laws, urban structures and practices, ceremonial performances, form of rulership, and the many texts and documents that accompanied these and circulated widely were devised coevally in Europe, the Americas, and Asia, and developed over time through mutual influences. As such, my study also shows that dichotomies such as East-West, center-periphery, colonial metropolitan did not obtain in the 17th century Spanish imperial geopolitics. This is evident in the way that the most distant possessions were integrated into depictions of the larger empire, for example. In his 1575 map, Juan López de Velasco included three Indies, 
the Indias del Norte, which included present-day southern United States, Mexico, Central America, and Venezuela, the Indias del Mediodía, which included the rest of South America, and the Indias del Poniente, which included all the western islands, the Malay Peninsula, the coast of China, and the Central Pacific. As John Headley has noted, by 1574, the Western Islands, or Islas del Poniente, comprising a complex of archipelagos and coastline, constituted already an integral part of what is generally called the Indies, or the New World. Furthermore, in Velasco's Geografía y Descripción Universal de las Indias, presented to the Council of the Indies in 1574, Mexico stood as the clear metropole for the Philippines, or as at the time Seville stood to New Spain. It is also worth noting that the first scouting expeditions of the Pacific by Álvaro de Saavedra in 1527-28 was launched by Hernán Cortés from Mexico, and that it was also Mexico and not Spain that later provided many more resources for these islands' economic and political development. Such initiatives were aimed at making New Spain not a peripheral domain of the Spanish monarchy for the simple exploitation of American metals, but a key area in the economy and policy of the larger Habsburg Empire. Furthermore, Cortes's early initiatives were later echoed by viceroys who sought to construct for the New World at the other end of the Pacific an economic partner by means of territorial and maritime expansion for new dominion. When Miguel López de Legazpi sailed east in 1565, he did not do so under the commission of the Viceroy of New Spain, but this time was charged by the Audiencia of Mexico. According to a letter published in Barcelona in 1566, Legazpi's achievements made the people of Mexico very proud of their discovery, which they think will make them the center of the world. The centrality of the Philippine Islands to the New World geography is also evident in religious writings of the time. José de Acosta, in his monumental Historia Natural y Moral de las Indias, published in 1590, was concerned as much with the Eastern as with the Western Indies of the New World. While the Spanish title does not make this clear, and this is very interesting, I think, uh, English and French translations at the time were more explicit. An English translation from 1604 by Edward Grimston, for example, was titled Natural and Moral History of the East and West Indies. Evidence such as this suggests that in this period, both Indies constituted a single whole, rather than two separate and radically different East-West domains, problematizing as well a central periphery ordering of the empire. During the 17th century, Manila never reached the sites of Mexico or Lima. Nonetheless, in the words of the Franciscan friar Juan Pobre, Manila inspired all, not for its meager garrison of 600 men, but for the numerous friars who pray prayed for it, standing like a lone spiritual sentinel of Spain to give light to that new world 5,000 leagues away. Manila, much like Lima at the time, or saintly Lima, rather, stood as an important stronghold of Catholic devotion in the farthest flanks of the 17th century empire. Now, central to the cultural viability of the political system of a vast empire such as um, that of the Spanish Habsburg was the presence of the king, as it was his royal image that held imperial society together and functioning as a cohesive body politic. From Charles V on, a fundamental new challenge to monarchical rule was how to make the king present everywhere all the time and accessible to various audiences throughout its far-flung dominions. Meeting this challenge required new technologies of rulership and of representation. Increasingly in the 16th century, the space of political action in this new imperial culture was the theatrical of the city. In the Spanish overseas possessions, as would increasingly become the practice also in Europe, the stage of this new cultural practice was the Plaza Mayor. 
Um, it was in the central space of power that 17th century life got played out by its central political actor, the king ever present in his simulacra. In the buildings surrounding this urban core and in the numerous ceremonies performed in his honor. My study elucidates how the king, as image, idea, body, and soul, was made real and present through these, uh, the use of new technologies of rule, particularly new deployments of the king's simulacrum, um, his royal portrait, archives, um, royal paper, his signature, I the king, um, his viceroy, and the ceremonies that accompany them as these were um, the new venue by which his royal presence was made legitimate as the ruler of a distant and diverse possessions. Intimately connected with the presence of the monarch was that of the city of his courtly residence. As the image of the king worked to centralize culture and politics around his body and simulacrum, the creation of a fixed residence for his court in Madrid, in similar fashion established a, a stable uh, center for his empire. In 1561, Madrid became the seat of the royal court. Philip II made Madrid into a new kind of courtly city by also shaping it to function as the center of the Spanish Habsburg government. This model of centralized political rule, however, had already been established, and it could be argued rehearsed in Mexico City in 1521 and in Lima since uh, 1542. My study suggests, therefore, um, that um, the, these prior experiences abroad not only shaped Philip II's designs and understandings of Madrid as the new political center for his empire, but how the replication of these designs and understandings throughout his empire ultimately tied king and city into one space for the exercise of legitimate monarchical rule in absentia. To this effect, I examined the role cities and certain forms of architecture played in this process of kingly political legitimation. The analysis of urban designs and cities as spaces of cultural production further revealed how the repetition of patterns in multiple locations of the Spanish world worked in tandem with the repetition of kingly ceremonies and the writings that contained them to endow and connect specific urban spaces with the aura and authority and the material wealth that went with it of the Spanish king. And how through this process, a hierarchy of imperial urban spaces closely tied to the figure of the monarch became the organizing principle of the vast empire. The new imperial urban geography that characterized the Spanish world reflected and was shaped by larger processes taking place at the time. The centralization of ecclesiastical and secular powers, for example, produced new spaces of social and political practice, not just in Europe, but also abroad. A byproduct of centralization was the court as a space for consumption and the exercise of political power, royal in the case of Madrid, with Lisbon in a middle ground, viceregal in that of Naples, Lima, and Mexico, and in Milan and Manila, governorships that closely resembled uh, viceregal courts. Decentralization further produced the reconceptualization of the city, as Anthony Pagnin has noted, and a redefinition of its role as the site of civitas, or a rationally ordered civic body. This ancient but renewed concept of civitas, now also understood as the political life lived in cities, had two important features, the urban grid and the plaza. Scholars have suggested the American origins of the latter and its influences in European urban designs. My study asks, therefore, how did the exchanges and transformations of old and new ideas and structures like the ruin and the plaza work to integrate massive spaces and multitudes of peoples into one meta-narrative of king and empire? How did these exchanges shape local and imperial conceptions of time and space, geographical location and belonging? How was imperial ruled, imagined, understood, and practiced? What were the consequences for historical understandings of the evolution and constitution of the empire in its various parts and in its entirety? How was all this modern Inco Arrubia sense 
how did this concept evolve over time and with what consequences. In general, the sign colonial Latin America was invented as an index of everything that is not modern, and it is routinely opposed to the sign modern Latin America. The rise and expansion of the modern, furthermore, is always associated with the rise of the West. When the political relevance of the Spanish Empire is acknowledged, the role of Spain in the formation of the modern spirit is nonetheless obscure or simply ignored by the leading role, uh, roles according, accorded to England and Germany and France and Italy. I suggest a different narrative of modernity and empire where so-called colonial or peripheral locations like Lima, Manila, or Naples were metropolitan centers with their own spheres of influence and activity. More importantly, this metropolitan modern was based not on a deep immemorial original antiquity or uh, past, but on 17th century concepts of greatness, as outlined by Giovanni Botero, that included geographical location near nav navigable uh, waters, urban magnificence, the presence of a nobility, the concentration of commercial wealth, a representative and popular het heterogeneity, a cosmopolitan culture, and the wide availability of luxury goods for, the consump uh, for consumption by the lower stratus of society, as well as new genealogies, all which uh, was arranged differently in the various locations of the Spanish Empire. Jorge Cañizares Esguerra has noted that the Spanish-American Baroque was aggressively modern in its endless quest for radical renewal. For William Edgington, the Baroque must be understood as the aesthetic counterpart to a problem of thought that is conterminous with that uh, time in the West, we have learned to call modernity, stretching from the 16th century to the present, or the problem of appearances and the reality they purport to represent. Bradley Nelson adds that ritual is not something rationalism leaves behind, but it's instead uh, at the very heart of rationalism and modernity's effort to mark an ontological break with the past. Well, William Childers has called for an understanding of the Baroque as a distinctive modernity, where rather than an inescapable hegemonic matrix, he finds a Baroque public sphere that worked differently from the bourgeois public sphere predicated on the transparency of print and coffee houses, but that nonetheless afforded venues of participation and political agency in spectacle and rumor, which is how he tra uh, translates the concept or the 17th century concept of publico notorio. Furthermore, for Serge uh, Gruzinski, the Baroque constituted a first instance of a global cultural phenomenon, or what he terms mondi mondalization, uh, not born in Europe and copied in its peripheries, but created and transformed by complex cultural, social, political, and economic exchanges that cannot be best understood within a center periphery framework of cultural production or as a derivative colonial phenomenon. Roland uh, Green, on the other hand, has argued that while the Baroque emanated from Europe, it got constituted in the New World. As first conceived, the Baroque not only spanned the world that radiated outwards from Europe, from Sicily to Mexico City to Macau, but operated as one of the original cultural idioms across this world, bringing these forms and ideas back to Europe. Grusinski, as pre previously mentioned, makes a simi similar argument about the Baroque as a mestizo cultural form that took and incorporated different elements that then traveled around the world. Furthermore, Jesus Escobar, in his study of the Plaza Mayor in Madrid in the mid-17th century, traced the influence of Hernán Cortés' descriptions of the plaza and temples of Tenochtitlan in the urban design and concepts of urban order in this most Habsburg of monuments and cities, as well as on the urban reforms that govern the redesign and or building of new cities and plazas throughout the Iberian Peninsula and other places in Europe after the discovery and conquest of the New World's mainland. Setha Lowe has made a similar argument in her work on the plaza in Central America. My own earlier work showed how what I term to be a European cultural grammar of Baroque ceremony got reworked and or reinvented in the viceregal context of Lima and beyond. 
In short, in my view, the Baroque and modernity were, from inception, all about distances, geographical, social, political, economic, and cultural, and about the quest to breach, but also rationally order, those distances and differences. The challenge posed by the effective ruling of the vast empire where the sun never set, as Philip II referred to it, gave way to new spaces for the exercise of political power, the urban space of theatricality of the city street and its stage, the plaza. It was in this space that political cultures got made, negotiated, transformed, and perpetuated, as this term was then understood. Ultimately, ceremonies dealing with the body of the king, such as his royal proclamation or, um, and his funeral, as well as the ceremony of the royal standard, where the oath of allegiance to the monarch was renewed annually, were not mere representations of monarchical power, but constituted a central instance of the actual exercise of his power. In other words, the Baroque spectacle did not create an alternative medium. It was rather the medium in which politics and social and cultural issues got played out, contested, transformed, and cemented into practice. This was the case not only in Europe and its Atlantic kingdoms, but extended over land and seas to the Philippines as well. Walter Benjamin underscored the centrality of the Baroque in reconstructing an archaeology of modernity. Benjamin, like others, however, located the origins understood as a rupture of a linear narrative of historical writing and ways of knowing of modernity in the 20th century Holocaust. In my view, the case of the Spanish Empire problematizes this understanding, given that the extension of the Holy Roman Empire, however symbolically, beyond um, Europe, produced a similar rupture to that outlined by Benjamin, as it required the invention of new practices of political rulership and thus of newly made knowledge, all which was then modern. Understandings of this rupture in history and modernity, however, cannot be best achieved within a framework that limits its scope of operations geographically or otherwise. Joyce Chaplin has noted that, quote, the field of Atlantic history has encouraged us to connect nations, peoples, and events. But while the term Atlantic has spread, it is not clear whether it has yet fulfilled its genuinely exciting promise to change the field. As the idea of the Atlantic, rather than um, raise new questions or introduce new methodologies, has simply repackaged very old issues as imperial governance, maritime commerce, long-distance migration, and transplantation of old world cultures, because books and articles with Atlantic in their titles rarely connect different lands bordering the Atlantic Ocean as more often they simply showcase one part of the oceanic geography. In her view, it is ironic that as the word Atlantic creeps across the academic landscape, risking becoming overextended and uh, emptied of meaning, each field is situated firmly within a national historiography and geography, assessing at most the influence that overseas events had on its corner of the world. In his recent book, uh, History in the Making, John Eliot notes that while he was one of the early proponents of At Atlantic history back in 1970, now sees its limitations, as it has become not only evident that there was no real integration of the North and South um, Atlantic regions before the late 19th century, but also that the Viceroyalty of Peru and the Philippines uh, were part of an Atlantic system with the latter as part of uh, the Viceroyalty of New Spain, making their exclusion no longer justified. In my view, a framework that privileges the Atlantic as the category of analyses, be it circumstance or cis-Atlantic, for studying the political culture, broadly defined, developed by the Spanish to rule over their vast empire, can only hope to tell, at best, uh, half of this very complex story. Given the vastness of its possessions and emphasis on an Atlantic axis limits how this first modern empire can be imagined and the questions that can be asked, if for no other reason than the fact that, as noted by Eliot among others, at the time the notion of, of a coherent Atlantic was yet to develop. <clears throat> 
but perhaps more importantly because the notion of the Atlantic or of an Atlantic world has yet to alleviate the frustration of trying to write a colonial history, in this case the, of British America, but also this could be said for Spanish America, within historiographical traditions centered around modern nation states. In my view, Atlantic history has not only been unable to escape the nation-state notions of space, geography, place, identity, and politics, but might very well end up more often than not reinforcing artificial boundaries that limit what historians ask, trace, imagine, and write. Alison Games points out that while historians of empire have long encompassed the Atlantic, among other ocean basins within their purview, they have not escaped a tendency to see the region primar primarily from the perspective of Europe and to look mainly within a single imperial geography, an approach that can divvy up the world in strange ways. I would add that, as I argued in my book on Lima, this anachronistic division or understanding of the Spanish Habsburg world has served to reinforce the notion of center peripheries, empire colonies, and exceptionalisms predicated on 20th century understandings, again, of geography, economy, politics, and history. At the core of this is, of course, the issue of the very language or the words and concepts used by historians to write these differences. Lima is a case in point. Understanding Limas's role in the larger empire beyond the nation and the Atlantic reveals not only a more complex set of political and economic relationships, but also greatly problematizes its position as either a space divorced from the interior of the viceroyalty or of the nation it sought to represent and govern, but also as peripheral to Mexico and or a colony to Europe in the 17th, but also in the 18th century. This is evident in works by economic historian Margarita Suarez, for example, and in David Stadniki's study of the economic and cultural role of the Portuguese merchant elite in the wider 17th century Spanish empire, where Lima figures very prominently. These studies are not the no yet the norm, however. This is in part because a new imperial history requires writing the history of ideas and elites along the lines of studies by Anthony Pagman, uh, Lords of All the World, or Patricia Seed, Ceremonies of Possession, both published in 1995, or um, uh, Puritan Conquistadors by Jorge Canizares, as well as some of the work by John Eliot. That few works have attempted what Pagden, Canizares, and Seed have achieved is in part due to the difficulty that such works present, given their scope. But perhaps more importantly, because focusing on ideas and elites presents a political problem for the history of so-called colonial societies, and therefore are anathema to fields steeped in social history with its emphasis on lived experience and ordinary people. Now, to conclude, um, the Spanish Habsburg Empire, and I had a couple of other, oh, I wanted to finish there. The Spanish Habsburg Empire was made up of a worldwide and utterly desperate composite of all principalities, kingdoms, and former empires that had enjoyed independent, separate existence for centuries with political institutions and traditions of their own. Reality that shaped and conditioned all social, political, economic, and cultural relations among all these different jurisdictions in complex, nonlinear ways. In addition, within empires such as that of the Indies or New World, the story was further complicated by the intricate hierarchy of cities that constituted and governed the continent, each with different rights, privileges, and obligations, and a shifting hierarchical relationship among them, all which extended beyond the proper confines of the space's name, New Spain, uh, Peru, America, Philippines, and so on. Furthermore, the Spanish Empire is not best defined by the often cited characterization of empire used by Edward Said, or as a relationship, formal or informal, in which one state controls the effective political sovereignty of another political society, and where this control can be achieved by forced political collaboration, by economic, social, or, or cultural dependence, and so on.
As I concluded in my book in Lima, or Nima, perhaps a better way to describe and think the imperial relationship between these various entities that made up the Spanish Empire, be it the Viceroyalty of Peru, Lima, and the Iberian Peninsula, or Madrid and Manila, and so on, is as a composite rule conditioned by an unequal interdependence among hierarchically ordered metropolitan centers. And where, as I noted above, such hierarchical relationship, uh, relationships were not bound by continental edges, but extended across lands and seas. Roughly circa 1570 to 1700, not only the east-west division of the world, which seems to be the underlying framework for many of these concepts and understandings, did not obtain in places like Lima, New Spain, or even Spain, as already suggested, but neither did the notion of Europe as the center with America or Asia as its periphery as an organizing principle of world order. Nor was there yet centralization and uniformity of rule, territory, law, language, culture in Spain, referred to at the time as Las Españas, or in Peru, Mexico, or Brazil, as these names often imply. Luis Felipe de Alencastro, in his study of slavery in 17th and 18th century Brazil, finds that rather than one unified subject, there were instead many Brazils, each one with different relationships to various places in Africa, but also Portugal. It is perhaps salutary to ponder further on Robert Borowski's point about the Pacific as a subject of study, or the need to remember that the field self-defined area of study, the Pacific, is a constructed artifact of the discipline. This can be extended to the subject Mexico, America, Atlantic, Asia, and so on, and that as such, there is nothing natural or obvious about any of these subjects, therefore. Peter Hume has made a similar observa observation about the undue centrality that what he terms an Atlantic axis has had in understandings of the workings of the 16th through 18th century world. This privileging of the Atlantic has resulted in a disproportionate focus on Europe's relationship with America, for instance, to the detriment of the roles played by Africa in the making of that world, a point also made by Alan Castro. The emphasis on an Atlantic axis has moreover also obscured the importance of a Pacific axis in the making of that same world. As Hume notes, the notion of an Atlantic axis is predicated on a particular form of cartographic representation and on particular understandings of geography, but also on assumptions or theories such as that of the center periphery brought into or contained within that geography. It is important to underscore perhaps the obvious that the Spanish Empire was not only an Atlantic Empire, as was perhaps the British until 1783, and which seems to serve as a loose framework for much of this historiography, whether implicit or explicitly. Nor was there one absolute center of power during the 16th and 17th centuries in the Spanish Empire, as once again the case of Lima illustrates. The fact that Madrid was a new creation of the 1560s is not a trivial fact here. Finally, if the Atlantic is a logical, if there is such a thing, unit of historical analysis, it is not a timeless unit, nor can this space fully explain all changes within it. As such, it needs to be carefully historicized and interrogated as framework and or organizing principle for understanding the problems and or set of relationships one is trying to explain. The Atlantic is not a log logical category in all cases always, for it is not or should not function as an empty category or simple depository to be filled with facts. What is the significance of an Atlantic that for much of the 16th and 17th century was thought to be a series of smaller, smaller seas? and or when seen as a larger whole, it, it was not called the Atlantic, but the Ocean Sea and or the North Sea. What are the uses of such a concept, given these facts? How does the, the notion of an Atlantic system or unified space shape our understandings of the issues at hand? How does this change or not when confronted with, say, a multiplicity of Brazils? Finally, 
It is also important, therefore, to remember that imperial processes, be it political, social, or cultural, were not unique to the Atlantic at this time, and that they did take place in distance destinations in very similar ways because they constituted responses to similar political, economic, and social conditions and challenges emerging coevally in more than one geographical space at any given time. The task then seems to me one of elucidating why and how differences arose from those similarities rather than the current emphasis on difference, which inevitably leads to exceptionalisms, being always mindful of the complex dynamics of the influences that shaped in particular ways those results rather than search for origins and originals in only one half or one quarter of that very vast Spanish Habsburg world.